Um, I'm wondering if YouTube is giving my notifications out because the Romans study, the last message, got far fewer hits than I would expect. I'm holding off on the next one to make sure because I don't want people to get who want to watch these to get feel behind. And also, with those studies, you can jump in at any point. A lot of times I'll see, oh, this guy's doing Romans. Oh, he's got 11 messages. Uh, I don't have, I, I'm behind. And then you, you can't get into it, right? Well, I try to make them fairly self-contained. And if they're, if one verse is connected to a previous concept, I usually try to go back and say, and we were talking about this and this, you know, so you can jump into those at any point. Um, but I wanted to say that the Lord is definitely speaking revival right now. And I don't like to use that word. That word is actually kind of Old Testament uh, revive us, you know. Uh, the concept is fine, but honestly, in the New Testament, the way it works is that his life dwells in us already. And he's in our spirit, and our spirit is life because of righteousness. Our spirit has been joined to the Lord who is the spirit. And that life is resurrection. It's the very life. It's the very power. It's the very person that God raised from the dead. And that power is working in us to maintain us. The, the first evidence of that power working is that Nothing can pluck us from his hand, and nothing can take away the witness of the Spirit that Jesus is the Son of God, and that he died for our sins and rose from the dead for our justification. That's why believing that is salvation. When you believe that, that's not just you agreeing to some facts, as John MacArthur and those guys try to say. It's actually you setting your seal that the witness of God is true and his testimony is true and it's God setting his seal on you that you are his and that transaction of a kind of like a double sealing you seal that you, you set your stamp yes I believe well he sets his stamp yes he's mine which came first well if you look at the whole Bible you have to say that God moved first we responded, but God moved first. And the way he moved was to reveal himself to us. And our spirit is really the organ that saw that light. Our spirit was dead and blind and then all of a sudden was illuminated and healed and made alive. And now that double ceiling joins us to the Lord. We grab, He grabs us, we grab him, and we are one. And that is permanent, and that power works all the time, bearing witness in us that Jesus is the Son of God. And that profession, that's the profession of our faith, and that profession is the evidence that we are His, evidence that His life is in us. However, our mind is a problem. Our mind has all the old baggage and concepts, and our soul has the, our soul is essentially an assembly of defense mechanisms that we put together in order to allow us to live in this world as orphans apart from God without hope and still survive the experience. So when the spirit is made alive, the soul needs to be renewed. Okay? And, you know, Romans 8 says that the spirit, the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. So we can be alive in our spirit and dead in our mind because the carnal mind, the mind set on the flesh is death. We can experience this situation where I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, which is the evidence that I have in life, but my soul is full of death. full of, And that death is due to condemnation that hasn't been resolved. Okay, Now the only remedy for the condemnation and the death is the gospel. So when we pray, oh Lord, revive us, revive us, revive us, that's not really what we should be praying. What we should be praying is that the word of the gospel 
would be made clear and the nourishment and the food would come and the light would shine and the life would be supplied through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's what we need. When you see revivals, so-called, in the New Testament age, what you're really seeing is the Word being opened up. I mean, Martin Luther, raised up to speak about justification by faith, started what we call, it didn't start, but it made a major impact on what we call the Reformation, and people said, well, that's a revival. But we, historically, we don't look at it as a revival. We say, well, he recovered the truth of justification. Which is it? Well, the truth of justification brought many people who believed that Jesus was the Son of God and died for their sins. And, you know, they had that witness, but were in death in the Catholic religion and in condemnation. And the word of the truth came and shattered the old concept, the old paradigm, and brought the light to their soul. And that light, in him was light, and our life, and the life was the light of man. That light has the life. And so it revives people, it changes their whole living, it swings their being into alignment with God. Because they live in a realm called the gospel. And, you know, I was in Romans, and Romans 1, he says, who, God is my witness who I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. Number one, you've got to serve, you've got to have your spirit made alive. And that comes by believing. But then you need to be in the gospel. And the gospel is on the one hand a set of truths that we believe. On the other hand, it is a realm in which we move. And it's Christ himself. And Romans 10 talks about that, that, you know, uh, the word of faith which we preach doesn't say who's going to bring Christ down from heaven or bring him up from under the earth, but the word which is in your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. What is that? That's Christ himself. Christ is released in the word of the truth of the gospel. And that's what we need. So we pray, revive us, but what we really need is a dawning of the truth to renew our minds. And we can be revived any day. We don't need a revival in the church to be revived ourselves. I used to live under revivalistic teaching in a charismatic church. And the pastor would always say, oh, we need revival, I need revival, I need revival. And now I understand, no, what you needed was the gospel. You needed to preach the gospel to yourself and stay in it as a realm to move and live and, and have your being in, you know. That is Christ. The gospel is Christ. He's the word of life. Um, and see, as charismatics, we would get revived sometimes in a sense, but it was an accident. We bumped into the spirit with all our groping. But it was rarely mixed with faith, with the word, for long enough for us to understand what was happening. And most of the revivals that we call revivals aren't. They're just manifestations of the flesh and stuff like that. But the Great Awakening was a real revival. What was the Great Awakening? Well, you had Whitfield and you had uh, Wesley and you had these great open-air preaching uh, that shook continents. Um, the gospel was being proclaimed and people were getting clear about the difference between works and grace and Christ. You know, it wasn't, their doctrine wasn't all perfect, but the gospel was shining really clear and it changed people's whole thing, you know. And so what the church needs is that kind of move. We need a release of the word. We need a release of the truth. We need to get our minds renewed. We can do that every day ourselves, but then we need to publish the word and speak the word and have YouTube channels about the word and share the word with believers who need to be, re quote, revived what they really need is to get their minds renewed. When you get your mind renewed, it releases the life that's in your spirit to be life and peace in your soul. And then that releases life to quicken your mortal body. That's what we'll see in Romans 8. 
so that you live righteously, not by effort, but by satisfaction in Christ. What we need is to enjoy Christ. We need to be satisfied with Christ. We need to be nourished with Christ. And this is all through the word of the truth. And so, yes, God is speaking revival and restoration. People are getting the word. People are showing me on their comments and in other comments on other YouTube channels that there's this season where they've got joy. Well, make sure that you understand why that joy is happening. It's because the word is being proclaimed more clearly. The Grace Channels, because of the persecution and because of the debate and because of how mean and nasty the terrors are uh, with their works prescriptions, the gospel's shining that much more clearly. We need that backdrop. Uh, and it's going to get worse. Um, because people are going to be able to make a clear distinction between the Lord's children and those who are not. Uh, based on, you know, just the sweetness of the gospel in people's hearts. So, um, God needs it to ramp up. We don't like it to ramp up, but unfortunately it's going to ramp up. The, the hardened hearts are going to get harder. Evil men and deceivers are going to wax worse and worse. So that's going to go on. But people are, people are repenting. Like there's a channel where there's a lady who's clearly out of control and she pretended to be a grace believer for a minute. And then she started launching attacks on everybody, and they just get nastier and nastier. They're going to get, keep getting nastier. She has to. Unless she repents, it's going to get nastier and nastier. Well, people on her channel who used to support what she's saying are now seeing real clearly the fruit and go, wait a minute, this is, this, I, this, I don't, I'm a Christian, I can't, you can't do that. You know, and they're coming back to the people she's accusing and apologizing to them. We've seen several examples of that. That is why we need... See, Paul says there must be heresies among you so that those are approved may be manifested. So we don't have to answer the accusations, and we don't have to go um, expose the you know false gospel and all that stuff. All we need to do is keep speaking the truth and let that truth reside in our heart and by the joy and the peace we have in us, we're manifested for what we are. That's God's seal of approval. It's the fruit of the Spirit. And no matter what our trouble in our life is and what people are saying about us, our joy is going to increase. As they wax worse and worse, our joy is going to increase because the gospel is going to be more clear. So when you say that revival is coming, please recognize the source of, of life. What that really means is that truth and light is being released and it's shining. Christ's face is becoming more clear. And we're seeing that there's a smile on it. <laughs> to the degree you come out of the law, which is the shadow, and out of legalism, which is shadows and darkness, you see, oh, they were obscuring his face. I couldn't see he's actually smiling at me. And that smile changes everything. And uh, that's that song again, you know, it's not the crushing of the idols with its bitter void and uh, smart, but the beaming of his beauty and the unveiling of his heart. And there's another verse in that that says something like, um, it was the look that captured Peter. Uh, I have to look that up. But basically the idea is, you remember, do you know what brought... Peter to repentance after he denied the Lord, the Lord just looked at him. If you're his, all he has to do is look at you and your heart will melt. And that's what we need to see. We need to see his face looking at us and let it melt our hearts. That's what we need. Not power, not spirit power, but a revelation of Christ that satisfies us. And if we're weak, fine. If we're vulnerable, fine. If we're broken, fine. Because he's our shield. We can be more and more transparent. We don't care. We're not trying to put up a front of righteousness because what we realize is that it is the Christ who is our shield and our strength. He's our vindicator. He's the one who deals with all of our situations and we just rest in him. We're just at peace here, you know. Um, okay, well, I gotta take care of some things, but yes, revival is coming, but it is a release of the truth that we should pray for. And if you go look at Paul, 
Paul's prayers, he'll pray. You'll see that that's what he prays in Colossians, Philippians, and Ephesians. Anywhere you see him praying, he's praying for people to come into the assurance of their salvation through the knowledge of the truth. And for the truth to be published and proclaimed boldly. All right, see ya.